I have, could everybody's attention, please? Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, this is our monthly men's group meeting, and of course, we opened up to a few other very, very special guests tonight, the ladies. Glad to have y'all. Um, tonight, our presenter is a very dear old friend of mine, longtime friend, I should say, Andy Wood. I think we were just talking about how long ago we met in 1981, so it's been, been a while. Andy's a career environmentalist, I guess. Uh, he spent his entire life working on making the planet a better place for the rest of us. He's done a pretty good job at it. He's published a book or two. Worked at the uh, aquarium at um, Fort Fisher as education cur curator. Spent a bunch of time working for Audubon over the years. And if I tried to cover his whole resume, that would take up the amount of time of the whole program. So there's no need to do that. He's just a um, really good, good, good guy, and uh, we're most fortunate to have him come talk to us tonight. So here you go. Thank you. Chris, does he need to talk into this so it'll record? Uh, yes, please. Sorry. Can you hold that? Sure. All right, thanks. That way it gets recorded. Okay. Well, good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, and I'm here, and thanks for the introduction, Dickie, uh, at Dickie's request, because somebody was asking about topics to talk about regarding creation care. And one of the subjects that came up, because we're here in southeastern North Carolina, was, of course, going to be PFAS. And so uh, if everybody would take out their notebook, we're going to go through the periodic table. And that way, you'll have some understanding of where fluorine fits in with carbon, fluorine being number nine on the periodic table. It's an inert gas. You, you don't want me to go there, really, do you? Um, but I will gloss over PFAS because somebody did ask about it. PFAS is a, um, uh, what some people are calling a, a, a everlasting, a long-living anthropogenic compound. So it's a human-made product um, by the combination primarily of fluorine, which is a gas, and is number nine on the periodic table, and carbon. And what they've done is combined different parts of fluorine and carbon to create PFAS and PFAS and uh, just a myriad collection of different chemical compounds, collectively known as forever chemicals because they, they, they don't go away. Um, think Teflon or um, water repellent on clothing. Those are uh, oftentimes going to contain PFAS chemicals. And um, a lot of attention has been given to this subject since primarily 2017 is when it officially broke news. Even though EPA had been working with it for many years before that, it didn't get to the to the newspaper until a reporter said, you know, there's a whole lot of this stuff being dumped into the Cape Fear River from this chemical manufacturing plant on the Cape Fear River. And, you know, there's research coming out saying that this is not necessarily a good chemical to have in our bodies or in our water or in our soil. So um, when the story broke in the Star News, um, I read it, and, and as Dickie mentioned, I was with the aquarium for 12 years, a dozen years, well, more, um, running the education program and trying to speak with people about matters environmental. I'm, I'm a life, I come from a very long line of biologists, so I'm genetically predisposed um, to have the same interest that you do. If you, care, if you have creation care in your heart, you're right there with me. Um, so, and I brought some examples uh, just to pass around show and tell. But um, PFAS broke in the news and everybody was up in arms about this compound in the Cape Fear River. And the first thing that came to my mind was what I had been talking about since I moved to Wilmington in 84, which is, well, you know, there are at least 16 municipal wastewater treatment plants lining the Cape Fear River from basically Greensboro to Wilmington, and they're all discharging millions of gallons a day each of 
what we call treated wastewater. And, and we're not going to stay on this subject for long. But um, when we say treated wastewater, we're not talking about clean water. It, it is only being discharged without chunks. It's clear water, but it contains every chemical compound that you flush down your drain, unchanged, whether it's a laundry detergent, a dish detergent, a chemotherapeutic. If we sample the Cape Fear River water, which I used to do, you'll find elevated levels of uh, caffeine, tobacco or um, nicotine, cocaine, opioids. Um, when we were doing fish samples downstream from wastewater plants collecting sunfish and doing bioassays on their fatty tissue, what we found is there were elevated levels of Prozac and Viagra. Those were some confused fish. <laughs> so, um, so when we talk about PFAS, that's very good. It got a lot of attention drawn to the issue of water quality. But in my uh, commentary to the newspaper following, my point was this is just the tip of the chemical iceberg that's in the Cape Fear and in other river systems. And then the phone calls started. People were rightly concerned about this. And so what I, the reason I'm talking about it right now is I want to try to put your mind at a little bit of ease, um, at least for our age. For this group here, we don't really need to worry about PFAS. It's, this isn't about us. This is about the next generations that are bioaccumulating this stuff right now. And so when you hear people talking about water pollution and protecting wildlife, which is what I've made a career doing, looking out for creation, if you will, um, plants and wildlife, I do that because I know we, our species, is at the top of the pyramid on the planet, the food pyramid. We're at the top. We can single-handedly take out a whale or a polar bear. Yeah, that's not what puts us at the top. What puts us at the top is we eat everything below us. So we are bioaccumulating everything that we put into the environment. So when you hear somebody like me talking about we need to take care of the environment, we need to clean up the water, we need to clean up the air, it's not because I'm trying to rescue some obscure beetle or a snail or frog or a fish, I'm worried about homo sapiens. And um, so that's my objective, is to get people thinking about us as part of creation, if you will. Um, and I'm using that term in a way that I never do, honestly, uh, because I'm with a, a group I don't usually get to speak with. Um, Everything we have here is all we have here. Here's some fun numbers. So you know Earth is, wasn't long ago that we didn't know Earth circled around the sun. There, not long ago we thought the sun rotated around us. But Earth is spinning right now at about 1,000 miles an hour. And we're orbiting the sun at about 70,000 miles an hour. And the sun is orbiting the Milky Way at about a half a million miles an hour. And the Milky Way is zipping through the universe at a million miles an hour. So in the time that we've been together tonight, we've already traveled well over a million miles through the universe, which I think is pretty cool. The moon is spinning um, on its own around the Earth at about 2,000 miles an hour. I mention this because right now there is a big anti-science push. I'm a scientist. I'm bilingual. I speak science and English. And I want to make this point to you. I'm assuming everybody believes we actually did land people on the moon. Right? We did. So the only way we could have done that is if we knew how quickly the Earth is spinning on its axis, and we had to know how quickly the moon is orbiting around Earth. 
And we know those two numbers to almost the foot per, mi- per hour, almost. We've got it down to less than a mile an hour, knowing what those rates are. If we didn't have that information, we could not have landed anybody on the moon. It would have just flat out crashed. We could have shot toward the moon, wouldn't have gotten anywhere near it. So why am I making this point? Because the way we learn that is through a process commonly referred to as the scientific method. We tested hypotheses, we tested theories, we came up with factual information to reinforce what we were trying to prove. And one of the things I love about scientists relative to athletes, athletes don't know the meaning of the word competition. What every scientist is trying to do is disprove what their best friend scientist holds to be true. I would love to be able to prove that one of Einstein's theories is incorrect. And trust me, there are lots of scientists working to disprove what we currently hold to be true. And that's a good thing. We don't assume. Occam's razor is a tenet that we hold that We use that to explain the uh, concept, the idea of the simplest explanation is best. Don't think it's like climate change. There was some talk, oh no, those are sunspots. No, they're not sunspots. Why, Why make it so complex? We know what's going on. We understand the greenhouse effect. So let me clarify one thing also because there's lots of mixed information about climate change human beings are not the cause of climate change there a scientist just said that humans are not the cause of climate change there is a however we are the change agent our activities serve as a change agent for the rate of climate change. So we need to understand that climate has forever changed since Earth has had an atmosphere going back billions of years. The first mass extinction came about when plants started to emit oxygen into the atmosphere and wiped out all of the organisms that did not breathe oxygen. All the bacterium that lived on carbon dioxide were wiped out. That was the first mass mass extinction brought about by an organism that produced oxygen into the atmosphere. So our atmosphere is forever changing. We're coming out of an ice age. We've been, well, we're in an ice age. We're coming out of the last glacial maximum. And that started well over 20,000 years ago. If we were here 20,000 years ago in southeastern North Carolina, we'd all be in parkas. It was very cold, really dry, very windy. You wouldn't walk out into the parking lot at night because there were dire wolves, flat-faced bear, saber-toothed lions, mastodon, muskox, all the things you would expect to see up in the Canadian tundra. They lived here. So this place has changed. What we consider home today is very different from what it was just 20,000 years ago. What we see today looks very much like what it looked like six to 8,000 years ago. The cypress trees that you've probably heard about up on the Black River, well over 2,000 years old, and we know that by increment boring. We've drilled holes into the trees to count the rings. That process of drying the sample and polishing it so that we could count the rings, that took over a year. But we now know those trees are well over 2,600 years of age. And their parents were well over 2,000 years of age. And their parents were over 2,000 years of age. And we know that by looking at the stumps, a process called dendrochronology. We look at the stumps of trees in a forest, and we can look at the rings of a stump that's been dead for hundreds of years and compare it to rings of trees that are still alive, and we can match up the years. It's really, it is so cool. So you can stand in a forest and date back 
what was going on in this forest. And if you look at uh, Google Earth and follow the Cape Fear River, you can see its channel winding out toward the continental shelf. And when you take a boat out the Cape Fear River toward the continental shelf, out toward Frying Pan Shoals, as you're going out and you're in 30 feet of water, your side scan sonar is pinging cypress stumps. And if you go to Fort Fisher and look at where the original fort stood, it was a quarter mile off of the beach. The condor, the blockade runner condor, ran aground on Fort Fisher Beach, but that wreck is over a quarter mile offshore. What does that mean? The shoreline is retreated. So as my colleague Oren Pilkey says to people living on the beach, you're kind of doomed. The ocean is coming. It's just coming slowly, but not really. When you hear somebody's, and full disclosure, I was a lobbyist on Capitol Hill for three years, working for climate and energy legislation, so I know how to talk to a wall, because I've done it. Um, when I would say to a politician, you know, the ocean is rising. Oh, yeah, I know, Andy, it's coming up three millimeters a year. Psh, wow. Or maybe not even that much. Okay, so you're not worried about three millimeters of rising ocean on a relatively flat coastal plain terrain. Have you ever spilled three millimeters of water on your kitchen counter? What does it do? It spreads out. It expands. So I don't use the term sea level rise. I use the term ocean expansion. And when I talk about the ocean, I'm talking about the great ocean. There is one ocean on Earth. The Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, Antarctic, they all communicate. It's one ocean. It takes a while for a drop to get from the Pacific to the Atlantic, but it's all connected. And it's actually connected in pretty strange ways through trees that through a process called evapotranspiration. Nobody's taking notes. You know there's a test. This is question six on the exam. Um, so the trees are drawing water out of the ground, evaporating it off of their leaves, transpiring it through their leaves. That moisture goes up into the atmosphere, literally forming clouds that rain on a farmer's land 100 miles away from where those trees are standing that pump that water into the atmosphere. So a farmer is benefiting from trees that he or she may never see. But the trees are part of what we call the water cycle. So all of this, the water cycle, the ocean, the land, all of this is basically the clean, uh, what do you call it on a picture before you paint it? Um, I'm drawing a, the canvas. The canvas for creation is the ocean, lakes, rivers, and the land along with the atmosphere. And I call this place that we live on Starship Earth, because it is. We're a starship. We have our own little atmosphere. And all of the species that live here with us, that dwell with us, I regard as rivets, or nuts and bolts, if you want. If we were in the, in the space station right now, imagine one of those astronauts looking at a rivet on the space station and saying, you know, I don't understand how that thing is providing any use to this space station. We don't need that rivet. Let's go ahead and just pop that out. And another astronaut might say, you know, this screw here, I really don't understand what it does. I, I'm not sure that it does anything for us. We can get rid of that screw. Every plant and different kind of plant and animal is a rivet, a nut, a bolt, a screw. It is holding together our spaceship Earth, quite literally. So when you are talking about creation care, you're talking about care for our environment, not elephants and whales. Well, yes, it is for them too but it's really about us. 
it, it's okay to say you care about the environment for the sake of people. I care about the environment for the sake of birds and turtles, but also for people. So I want to, sh how much time do I have? So I'll be quick. I want to, you've all heard about the Venus flytrap, I'm sure, ad nauseum. <clears throat> this is what a flytrap looks like in the wild. You can just barely see it. Tucked in with sphagnum moss. And in this example, this is just a dollop of soil. Dickie's been out to my property, so he knows what it looks like. I have a fire break around my property. I live on the edge of Holly Shelter. And every once in a while, a flytrap or a pitcher plant shows up in the fire break, and I'll dig it out and pot it up, or I'll just move it. Well, this is a little dollop of soil that contains at least 12 different kinds of plants. So when we talk about flytrap, what I talk about with a flytrap isn't just a single plant by itself. It's living in a commune sort of situation, a community, with other plants, and even with animals that they happen to eat. <laughs> so, um, so in our area, southeastern North Carolina, and I'm assuming you're all familiar with where we are, <clears throat> southeastern North Carolina is part of the, uh, what was recently recognized as the North American Coastal Plain ecoregion. And we've known that this is an ecoregion that extends basically from Cape Cod to the Gulf of Mexico, but it's now referred to as a biodiversity hotspot. And that's because within this swath of coastal plain habitats, Alabama, North Carolina, parts of Florida, Texas, we have over 1,500 different kinds of plants. That rivals the tropical rainforests of Brazil. The big difference in Brazil, the plant diversity is 100 feet off the ground, up in the tree canopy. Here, our plant diversity is on the ground. Where this building sits, before this was built here, I'm very confident that I could have walked this property, spent some time on the property, and I would have come up with probably close to 120 different kinds of plants that lived right here. And I know that because I've done a lot of work on the property behind this church uh, that now has a Pluris wastewater treatment plant and all those buildings being constructed. Um, the developer actually hired me back in 04 and then again in 14 to show them what places should we avoid. And I showed them what places, and they said, those are all the uplands. That's what we're going to be building on. So um, when a consultant doesn't tell their client what they want to hear, you don't get rehired. So that's fine. So they're building it out. My point is, where we are right here on Sidbury Road, this is part of what my colleagues in the state natural heritage program identify as a significant natural heritage area. And that's because of the incredible plant diversity here. Fly traps used to be right under this building. Pitcher plants, Cooley's meadow rue, sundew, butterwort, orchids. Five different kinds of orchids lived literally on, on this hallowed ground. So this is a very biodiverse area. We're on the same latitude. If you travel due east of here, you'll skip over the Atlantic Ocean, part of the Great Ocean, and you'll land at Casablanca. And behind that, on the same latitude as us, is Baghdad. Go due west of us, you end up in LA at the Pacific. Due north is Rochester, New York. And then due south, you skip over Cuba and end up at the Panama Canal. So you have your compass points now when you're walking around outside, you know where you are. We are a distinct spot on the planet. And I, I catch myself saying, this, this, we're the, this is such a unique place. Well, really, everywhere is unique on the planet. 
go to Australia, which I haven't, go anywhere on the planet and you can say, wow, this is a unique spot. There's nowhere else like this. And that is very true. So this is um, definitely more biodiverse than somewhere most of Iowa, for example. 98% of Iowa has been uh, tilled. They're now trying to bring back uh, bison in some areas by re doing some uh, prairie restoration. Our area, we're not yet at the point of trying to restore habitat. I do some at a small scale. We're at the stage now where restoration comes next. Right now what we need to do is protection. We need to figure out what parcels of land can we protect into the future. And I'm not naive enough to think that at some point this area won't look just like Houston. It, it may. But in the time being, we can set aside pieces of this area, for example, Sledge Forest, which is over next door to the GE plant uh, in northern New Hanover County. That's slated 4,000 acres, uh, uh, privately owned. I totally get it. The owner has uh, full rights by right to develop that property, but the reason I've got a problem with the way it's going about is the county commissioners back in 2016 looked at that property, which was zoned originally in 06 as resource conservation, aquifer recharge, wetland protection. That's what it was zoned in 06. But in 2016, they took it upon themselves with no fanfare and very little public input, they rezoned it to community mixed use, meaning they could put in a car wash next door to an apartment complex next door to a mobile home park next door to high-end houses. Anything goes. Anything goes. So they can do that, and they did, and now all of that 4,000 acres 3,000 of which flood every day. A thousand of those acres don't flood, but they're taking into account 4,000 acres to say, oh, you can put in 4,000 homes on 1,000 acres, four houses to an acre. And you can do it without pushback from the residents because you can do it by right. We've, the commissioners, have given you that gift. So you and I have no say in what's happening in your own county. You won't have an opportunity to speak to the commissioners. Even if you're a neighbor and the developer is going to build their access road through your neighborhood for 30,000 cars a day from that one subdivision, and you're not allowed to ask a question about it. You have no opportunity to raise your voice. So, in the interest of creation, because this area contains the oldest growth longleaf pine in New Hanover County, over 300 years old. Longleaf pine rarely reach over 400 years, rarely. And there's really only a few left up in Weymouth Woods near Fayetteville. The 3,000 wetland acres has cypress trees over 500 years old, never cut. And they're just going to go in and scrape it clean and throw up whatever they want. These are developers out of Myrtle Beach, with all due respect. Um, they'll make their money and they'll get out and we're all going to be stuck with the 30,000 additional cars. And it's not like any of us who live here need that subdivision, right? We, we don't need it and yet you're going to pay for the infrastructure required to build it with your taxes, and yet you don't have a say with the commissioners. So we have a town hall meeting scheduled for next Saturday in Castle Hain. Uh, our website is sledgeforest.org. It's very simple. We have a petition up there. We put up the petition less than a week ago. We have almost a thousand signatures already. There are a lot of upset people in that area whose lives is, are going to be 
pretty much upside down when they start doing this construction. So here, th this is just one example of the issues we're going to be dealing with in the game of the environment. And you're going to be hearing uh, soon about EPA being cut um, and other, and, uh, lots of environmental regulations being cut. There's going to be lots of lawsuits. This is going to be wildly expensive. Um, and it's all going to come out of our pockets. But when you hear people talking about EPA workforce being cut, that means no more sampling of our water. So you won't know what volume of PFAS there is in the water. You won't know what other chemical compounds are in the water. It's easy to say, I don't care about a turtle. I'm not talking about turtles here. I'm talking about human beings. We are essentially deciding that our lives are just not worth worrying about. I've been in the game of the environment literally all of my life. My father was research director for the American Cancer Society. Imagine the things I heard as a little kid, way too young to understand what my father, who was a consummate scientist, when I asked my father a question, I got a straight up answer, whether I understood it or not, whether it was something my mother wanted him to tell me or not. So um, I'm not new to this. And uh, I'm deeply grateful that Dickie invited me to come speak with you because we really need your help. Um, there's some topsy-turvy times ahead. The ripples, the shock waves have already gone out. There are people, my colleagues in EPA, that are already looking for work. They're already ready to leave. And these are the people who ensure what your air is like, what your water is like. FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. I'm really curious if they're going to take away vaccines from humans, are they going to take away vaccines from livestock? I got my first rabies shot in 1983, and I was so grateful to have it because I was working with animals that could get rabies. And I'm no longer inoculated against rabies, but I was really glad to be. Hoof and mouth disease, if cows could talk, do you think they would turn down a vaccine for hoof and mouth? So these are heady, heady issues coming up. And I'm not talking about politics here. I'm talking about ethics, morality, not politics. So there's a big distinction. Yes, sir. just the way that Houston evolved. And I was a surveyor in Houston back 1973. Um, I was head chainman for DevCon. And I told bulldozers where to go. Um, and I remember when the apartment buildings went up and when I revisited Houston 20 years later, those apartments were long gone and now they're all cement, clay and glass, high rise buildings. So what we see today in Wilmington, all the car washes, the storage units, those are temporary. Those aren't going to be here for very long. They're gonna get scrubbed away and something else is gonna go in their place. That was all I was referring to with Houston, is it, it evolves. And Houston is so incredibly prone to flooding. Um, I grew up in Connecticut and my parents moved, my mother and stepfather moved to Houston in early 70s. And um, they weren't in their house two years before it flooded and then flooded again. And uh, finally, they left that one and went to another subdivision. But uh, Houston has incredible flooding problems. My stepsister still lives there. She's been flooded multiple times. Houston is very flat. It's, it's ocean flat. Um, so that's the similarity. Yeah. Right. Of time. But at the same time, it's 
The, and one difference we have from Houston is a network of rivers that communicate with the ocean. The Cape Fear communicates directly with the Atlantic Ocean. It's the only major river in the state that does. All the others discharge into a sound or a bay. So when we get these horrific floods or, or rain events, like that unnamed tropical cyclone eight a couple of months ago that dumped copious amounts of rain in Brunswick County, shutting down every evacuation route within the evacuation zone established by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the Brunswick Nuclear Power Plant. Imagine if that had been a hurricane and the nuclear power plant had had a catastrophe and all of the evacuation routes in Brunswick County were closed. Nobody could get out. So I've addressed this with the county commissioners in Brunswick and they just kind of, oh, yeah. Really? Are, are you not paying any attention to what's going on? So um, there are lots of people that want to move here. Fine. Let them pay to move here. That's kind of how it works. But instead, we are all being charged for the infrastructure to bring in all of these people that want to move here. Understandably, I can't imagine a more enjoyable place for me to be than in southeastern North Carolina because there's just so many neat things for me to look at. And we're going to do a quick math exercise, and then I'm going to be done. If you look through that viewer, just hold it to the light, you'll see little things squiggling around in it. Those are daphnia, copepods, ostracods, and amphipods. And they're all related to this crayfish. And I mentioned the flytrap earlier, and you're probably all well aware that flytraps occur only within about 80 miles of Wilmington. Remember, half of that 80-mile pie is ocean, and the other half really doesn't support flytrap, but in a few places. Um, so flytraps are well known. That crayfish you're looking at is called the Croatan crayfish. The only place in the world that you can find that species of crayfish is right here in southeastern North Carolina. But wait, we even have our own salamander. That is called a broken striped newt. The only place in the world that you can find a broken striped newt is southeastern North Carolina. So when I say this place is unique and special, those are just a few examples of what makes this place unique and special. So why the little Tiancy jobs that you're looking at in the viewer? Those are the smallest, some of the smallest things that you can find in a pond. Here's the math exercise. I mentioned a food pyramid earlier, of which we are at the top. So let's imagine a food pyramid, like you would see on a box of cereal. Around the food pyramid is air, water, soil, and sunlight. At the bottom, is plant material. Above the plant material are animals that eat plants. Above that are animals that eat animals that eat plants. Above that, animals that eat animals that eat animals that eat plants, until eventually you get to us. So when you think of this as a ladder, each time you climb a rung on that ladder, you have to multiply the amount of energy required to take that step by 10. So those little tiancies you were looking at, they are food for a small fish called the mosquito fish. And this is clean pond water. They look like a guppy. They're the North American counterpart to the South American guppy. They're cousins. And um, so our mosquito fish, so named because mosquito larvae in a pond are ice cream to them. Um, mosquito fish eat all those little tiancy jobs. One mosquito fish weighs about a gram. In order to get to be a gram, it has to eat at least 10 grams of food. 
If you're a farmer, a rancher growing cattle, if you want to put a pound on a cow, you got to feed it at least 10 pounds of silage to build up that weight. So each time you climb a rung on the pyramid, multiply by 10. A one gram mosquito fish had to eat 10 grams of little teinsies. What eats a mosquito fish? A sunfish. A one pound sunfish would have to consume at least 10 pounds of mosquito fish equivalent, not just mosquito fish, other fishes too, but 10 pounds of small fishes, which in turn had to eat at least 100 pounds of those little teinsies. What eats a sunfish? As an example, a largemouth bass. A one pound bass had to consume at least 10 pounds of sunfish equivalent, which in turn had to eat 100 pounds of mosquito fish equivalent, which had to consume 1,000 pounds of little teinsies. Now, I wouldn't boast about a one pound bass, Dickie would. What about a 10 pound bass? A 10-pound largemouth bass had to consume at least 100 pounds of sunfish, which had to eat at least 1,000 pounds of mosquito fish, which had to eat at least 10,000 pounds of little teinsies. A school bus, five tons of little teinsies, is required to produce one 10-pound bass. Is everybody with me? So... What then Senator Dole asked was, well, you know, Andy, we all care about the environment, but we have to take care of the economy. I was so waiting for her to say that. And I came back with, well, okay, in North Carolina, the pursuit, capture, and release, we don't eat largemouth bass because they're contaminated with methylmercury and PFAS, so we throw them back. The pursuit, capture, and release of largemouth bass, not trout, flounder, just this one species, is worth over $150 million a year in North Carolina. That's a pittance. It used to be much more than that. In Texas, it's close to $2 billion. Florida, $1.7 billion. Oklahoma, Oklahoma, almost $2 billion chasing largemouth bass. How could that possibly be? Go to Concord, North Carolina, Bass Pro Shop, who should hire me as their spokesperson. Bass Pro Shop, out in the parking lot, there is a beautiful 19-foot Ranger bass boat, purple, sparkly, gorgeous, hooked up to a brand new Ford F-150 pickup truck. The boat's sitting on a trailer, and on its stern is hooked a 250 horsepower Evan Rude motor. The boat haul, forty-five dollars to $60,000. The trailer, a couple two, $3,000. The motor, $100 per horsepower, I believe is what you told me. So roughly $25,000 for the motor. The Ford pickup, $80,000 for a clean $200,000. You too can leave Bass Pro Shop after you go in and buy the clothing, the rod, reel, terminal tackle, fishing line, all the other accoutrements you need to look like you know what you are doing when you go chase that largemouth bass that you're then going to throw back, meaning you don't have dinner. So you're going to go to a restaurant. And, well, you don't have breakfast, so you're going to a restaurant for breakfast. You're going to go to the grocery store and buy all your stuff for lunch, but you've got a $200,000 rig that you just went to that rural community in Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, California, or North Carolina, and you're not sleeping on the ground. You're going to go to a hotel. That's how those numbers get built up. And it's with the largemouth bass, it's economic revenue going to rural communities, not a city. Wilmington, yeah, we have anglers that come here and go out in big boats chasing big fish out in the ocean. But in parts of Oklahoma, Nevada, Missouri, there it doesn't get much more rural than that. But the bass fishing is almost second to none 
in Nevada, Missouri, where I've been, and worked with farm managers there to help them understand why we don't want their cattle going down into the streams. And I showed them by dip netting out a little young bass fry and asked the manager, Frank, hey, uh, there's a young bass here. There must be a lake somewhere. Oh, yeah, it's where I go fishing all the time. It's about six miles downstream. Well, you know, this little bass is trying to live in this creek, and your cattle are making a mess of it. And that, I was there for a teacher workshop. And nobody could find Frank that afternoon because he had his crew fencing off that stream. That's how easy it was. I just made a suggestion. Based on human want, he wanted largemouth bass. So while I can extol the virtues of plants and wildlife all day long and the importance of protecting plants and wildlife, I can talk about it all day long, all night long, I do. Um, the takeaway that I want all of you to get from me is, wow, this guy cares about people first. That's my main interest, is in humans. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't take care of our environment, we're certainly not going to take care of the environment for everybody else. The turtles, frogs, fish, birds, all those other things our cohabitants here on Starship Earth. What have I missed? Have I covered it? So thank you that you've got an interest in trying to take care of this only place any of us can live. And what does the astronauts say as they're launching off of Cape Canaveral? Boy, I sure hope we get back, right? They're not interested in going, some want to go to Mars, have at it. Well, no, actually, we need to scale back how much pollution we're putting in the atmosphere, sending spaceships up. But anyway, yes, sir. I seem to remember something on the TV about this wall that's being built. Kamora is building a wall that's going to save the uh, Cape Fear River. Can you tell me about that? Um, they... It, it's, it, I think they have an idea of, that the wall is going to prevent PFAS from migrating off of their property through sheet flow erosion, get just migrating off of the landscape into the water. So um, unless that wall goes down fairly deep into the surficial groundwater, which may only be six to 12 feet deep, but they're going to have to put in some kind of, a, of a, um, an aquitard that goes into the soil as well. I honestly don't know very much about the wall that they're proposing. My guess is it's not going to have a terribly great impact one way or the other, mainly because PFAS is such a tiny molecule that it just it, it volatile, it doesn't volatize, that's wrong. Totally wrong use of that word. Um, uh, that's what makes it forever. When you combine fluorine with carbon, it produces a compound that is very difficult to break apart. And it doesn't break apart. And the problem is, and don't be afraid of fluoride, uh, but fluoride comes from fluorine. Uh, but fluorine is wickedly toxic, and that's what has so many people concerned about PFAS. It's not that we know everything we need to know, it's that we lack a lot of information about what we know we need to know, and we haven't been able to figure it out yet. So endocrine disrupting chemicals, that's been a thing with me and wildlife for decades, and we're only now starting to talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals and children, including endocrine disrupting chemicals that are in the food that children are consuming out of throwaway plastic packages. So the, the more you can get away from plastic packaging, the better, because that's leaching all kinds of things. And um, so speak up, this is your planet, it's not owned by politicians. They answer to us. And um, 
That's my sage advice for the evening. Federal EPA. Mm -hmm. Is, are there state organizations that are similar to the federal EPA? Um, and, yes, and luckily North Carolina seems to be stable right now. So Diener, is, Diener has a, sh a staff shortage right now. Um, they're way understaffed. But that's probably going to change here real quick. Um, we're going to see an influx of EPA employees moving to North Carolina to work for Diener. Um, so, and that, as I mentioned earlier, those shockwaves have already gone out. There are people in Washington right now that are dusting off their resumes. They're getting out because they don't want to get fired. They, they want to resign and get another job. So, federal? Government? federal. Fed, EPA is federal, yeah. No, no, they don't have the brain. With all due respect, they don't have the brain trust. They don't have the equipment. They don't have the laboratories that EPA has. That EPA funds, a lot of EPA funding goes to individual states to set up laboratories and to manage laboratories. Um, and then universities, Duke, NC State, even UNCW, um, Chapel Hill, they get grant funding from EPA to do collaborative work, including with things like PFAS, but other issues as well. Um, so the challenge with losing brain trust in EPA, either through retirement or uh, just people leaving Washington, is that's the hub of, that's the brain trust in Washington. And so, what I've been told is the, the message from on high is you're comfortable here in Washington, but we're going to be moving you to Nevada, Missouri, and, and that's where you'll finish your career. And you know, these are people with multiple PhDs who, they're the people who identified PFAS as example. Um, they're just brilliant individuals, and they're right now being treated like dirt. So um, that's a problem in my mind, not for me, I'm almost 70, but it's a problem for my kids and my grandson. And I know that. That's what's really disheartening is there's, there's so much that you don't want me to talk about that I won't. And, and part of the, thank you. you, you actually really raised a very important point. EPA is the, inf the Environmental Enforcement Agency, not the Corps of Engineers. Corps of Engineers answers to the EPA. EPA is who enforces Clean Water Act, Clean Water Act. Um, the Corps of Engineers has to get a permit to pollute water. They've got to get a permit to do it. So you may get fined by the Corps of Engineers, but they are serving as an arm of EPA, separate entities working together. But EPA is the environmental law enforcer, and that's what we're going to be losing. So if Chemours is worried about the amount of money they have to spend keeping PFAS out of the environment, soon they may not have to worry about it. And I'm not saying that glibly. We're done. What is it again? Lee, V E L D I N. Wasn't he the uh, guy running for governor of New York City? That was just announced today, I think. I don't. I don't. Um, but if, if he's a, a political appointee, he is probably woefully inadequate for the job. Um, it, it's truly amazing what 
the Environmental Protection Agency does. And I like to give them grief as well as anybody else. Um, but without them, I, I grew up without Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act. We all did. We didn't have that until 1973. And suddenly, uh, the Houston Ship Channel quit burning and Lake Erie quit catching on fire. Fancy that. I grew up in Connecticut. My, I've told Dickie this more than a couple of times. My blue sky was gray. It was not the color of my pants, but it was a light gray. A clear, cloudless day, light gray. I did not see a blue sky until 1970 when I came to Cape Hatteras with a group of museum brats that I grew up with. And we were taken on a field trip to Cape Hatteras to chase snakes and lizards for a week as a reward for the work we did leading up to Earth Day 1970. And we got to Cape Hatteras and all of us were dumbstruck by a blue sky. I mean blue sky. None of us had ever seen one. We were all excited as little kids loading in the bus to go to New York City to the Bronx Zoo or the Museum of Natural History because, wow, it's like smoking a pack of cigarettes. One day in New York City was like smoking a pack of cigarettes, and we thought that was the coolest thing. Little did we know. Now it's cleaned up. Now in Connecticut you can see a blue sky, but it was gray for me. So... Anyway, as I have said, I will talk all night, so somebody needs to bring out the shepherd's hook and... I got a chance last Saturday to ride back here in Blake Farm, and that going back there for over two miles back in it. And the forest land that's gonna be destroyed back there they're changing natural streams that flow through the land. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really was an eye opener to see what destruction is going to be to this environment in this area. And I've lived here since 1968. And I've been in this area since the 50s. Yep. And my father in law had a little place on the wall. And I've seen the mass destruction in this area. It's, it's staggering. And, and I know... It's unbelievable what's going to happen back here. Right. And I, again, I was hired as a consultant in there. I've walked every, not square meter, but I've been in throughout you most of it. No, no. I've been given the high sign a couple of times. Quit talking. Thank you. Thanks. And we're not going to give Andy the hook, and I will not put him on the uh, spot and say we'll have him back any time. He'll come any time, but he probably will. Be glad uh, to. And from, from the men's group, we need to have a uh, 